Grab your Bibles. Um, go with me to Daniel. Go to Daniel uh, chapter 1. Chapter one. <sighs> Let's just jump in there that the Holy Spirit would just move. Um, as I was sharing with first service, a pastor, a passage many, many years ago we visited. God is just leading me back there again um, to just share just from a slightly different perspective. And um, as we were preparing for our 21 day of fasting, we put a little brochure together for distribution in case you uh, want to know what fasting is all about, want to know what a Daniel fast is, want to know the different type of fasting, and particularly um, based on what the Bible says about fasting, we uh, extracted some excerpts um, and compiled it and put it available for you, so make sure you get that. It's also going to be available on um, our website for those who may need it so that the good Lord um, can prepare us to be who God would have us to be. But I wanted to look at this passage in front of us just to lay some foundation as we move forward to this morning. So go with me to verse 8 of Daniel chapter 1. And when you are there, say amen. And then we're going to read it. Verse 8 says, um, But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore he asked the chief of the eunuchs, to allow him not to defile himself. Verse 9 says, And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who assigned your food and your drink. For why should he see that you are in worse condition than the youths who are of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. Verse 11 then Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, test your servant for ten days, and let, it be given, uh, let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink, and let our appearance and the appearance of the youth who eat king of the food observed by you deal with your servants according to what you see. Verse 13, let our appearance and the parents of the youth the king's food be observed by you and deal with, the, deal with your servants according to what you see. We're going to look at that again uh, next week. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. beware of the king's food. Beware. Yeah, turn to your next na other neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. said, beware of the king's food. Baby, let me pray and then we're going to share a little bit with you. Lord, we thank you for you. Thank you for what you're doing. You are an awesome, wonderful, gracious, and mighty God. So as we go to your word this morning, Holy Spirit, speak through me to your people afresh. I say this every second service, a fresh anointing, because this is a fresh group of people. Only what you want said, not what Felix believes ought to be said. So we open our hearts to speak to you. I empty myself that you would move as we prepare this church just to make another journey with you. So give our hearts to you. We commit that you be God in our midst and that we do nothing but obey you. Bless and have your way. In Jesus' name we pray and thank you. Amen and amen. Let me just say this um, by way of introduction based on some of the things I shared with you uh, this morning. I think it's very, very important that we all remember the truth that this world is not our own, our home, that all we are is that we are aliens passing through. If I make that statement, does that statement make sense to some of you? Come on, does it make sense? Yeah, that, 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 that we must understand the term I used um, when I processed the statement is that we are resident aliens, right? Meaning that we are heaven bound. Heaven really is our home. This world is not our home. We're here for a temporary time on our way to be where Jesus lives. Now, the issue with the statement that I'm making is you must understand that while we are here, the enemy's job is to cause you and I to forget where home really is, right? And the predominant way he does that is he tries to, my words are, enculturate us and to get us to forget the culture of where God is trying to take us to and let us adjust to the culture of this word. So the term I use is that he has a way of assimilating us even though we're in the world, he tries to make us look like the world. He tries to make us function like the world. He tries to make us to behave like the world. And the sad, comment, the sad commentary is the truth that he's winning. Come on, y'all. 
Come on. I mean, when, when you assess the church today versus the church of yesteryear, it is very different. There was a time where we wouldn't compromise on biblical values. You would not compromise on behavioral patterns and or lifestyle. But it seems as if anything goes. We're becoming more and more complicit as time lapses on. And what we're not realizing is that at the end of all of it is we are being assimilated more and more to look like the world, losing the impact that God would want us to have in the world. Come on. I, I want us to get that. I want us to get that. We are a called out people. We are a separate people, a people belonging to God, and we're left in the world to change the world, not to conform to the world. Can I get an amen if you, as you process this? And so when you look at the text that's in front of us this morning as we transition to the text, the, where we find ourselves today is no different than where the, the characters or, or the players in this passage that we're going to look at found themselves when they, when they ended up in Babylonian captivity under the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar. We know the story of them going in exile. We know the story of them being relieved from exile. But I think it's important that we understand that as they were going through what they were going through, everyone did not conform. And, and I want to press this because as we are on the front end of this period of just seeking God and praying and fasting, I want us to really understand the true essence of what we're about to undertake, where we're going, what we're about to do, such that when we face trials and temptations and tribulation, we know how to beware of the king's food. I, I think we need to understand that. We, we, we need to recognize that so we can be aware of it. So what I want us to do is I want us to look at this text, and I want us to, to walk through it a little bit. Go with me to uh, verse 1 of chapter 1, and I'm going to move through as fast as I could, and as fast as I tried to move this morning, I still did not make it through the sermon in its entirety, so we're ending up with a two-part series, amen? So, so look at verse 1. Look at verse 1. Let me just read this real quick and lay some foundation for us to get to where we need to go. If you're there, say amen. Verse 1 says, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Ber Jerusalem and besieged it. Verse 2, I say this every time I see it. It's troubling to me because verse 2 says, And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Judah, into his hands with some of the vessels, the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, the, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. I don't know about you, but is there ever a time in your life when you feel as if God gave you up? Come on, let's be, can we be honest this morning? Have you ever hit that dry place? Have you ever hit that situation where you feel as if the Lord is not there for you, as if he's turned his back on you? Well, well, I mean, let me just say this to encourage you. Regardless of what it feels like, you still have the encouragement in knowing that God will never turn his back on you, right? But there's sometimes, there's sometimes when God will allow us to undergo situations and circumstances to test our strength, to teach us lessons, to teach us situations so we can be more of who he would have us to be and less of who the world would want us to be. So when you look at this text, and by way of literary context, the, the Israelites find themselves serving God and worshiping God, and now this Babylonian king by the, the name of Nebuchadnezzar engages them in battle, and, and verse 1 says, and he besieged it, and verse 2 says, and the Lord gave Jehoiakim, who was the king at the time, into his hand, and strikingly, the text continues by saying, he even allowed him to take some of the vessels of the house of God, capital G, and he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, small g, and he placed the vessel in the treasury of his God with a small g. Now, why am I pointing that out? Because it's important for you to realize that when a king besieged another country, what is implied in a literal sense is rulership, dominance, um, overthrow. So what you see in the text is that God somehow allowed this king Nebuchadnezzar to come and to defeat his own people. And, and this is what I say, and they took the box from them. Right Now, you might be wondering what the box, that's my metaphor for the Ark of the Covenant. It took their, their, their articles of worship. 
He took the articles that they would worship, and then he took it with him, and he goes back to his temple, and he places it in his temple. Now, why is that information so important? Because if you were in that place in that day and age, and you were defeated by the king, and they took all your articles of worship away from you, and place it now in their temple underneath of their God, there's a sense where you feel as if God has failed you. Come on, talk to me. And there's a sense where you feel now that you are under a different authority. So the natural defense mechanism is to do everything Everything that authority is trying to get you to do. Survival mode. Can we talk for a moment? Come on, talk to me. You ever find yourself in a place where you're being pressured to do things you ought not do and survival instinct comes in? Come on, talk to me. And then we adjust and we compromise. We compromise. Can we be honest this morning? Am I the only one that have messed up and compromised or do I have some honest people that'll say, me too, preacher? Come on, me too. Are you with me? And especially when you feel you can't get a prayer through because the enemy is pressing down on you. Come on, do I have a church this morning when you fell up and seeking God? God, why did you allow this to happen? <laughs> and here's the thing you got to understand. Here's how I started the message that where we find ourselves today, we are strangers in a land. The earth belongs to the enemy. He's the prince of the earth. Even though it says scripturally the earth is the Lord, he's still the prince. So here's what that means. We are in God's kingdom, but God's kingdom is placed in the world. And the goal of the enemy is to get us to assimilate into his kingdom so we can, we can forget who we really are. Are you with me? So we can forget who we really are. So as we look at this text that's in front of us, I want you to see three guys, I mean four guys. I want you, no, I want you to see these guys in the text. Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, these four guys, and the stand that they took. So now I want you to see what the king is doing now as it relates to enculturating them to assimilate them into his kingdom. So look with me at verse 3. Verse 3 says this. Then the king committed Aspinaz, uh, commanded Aspinaz, the chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youth without blemish of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, and learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace. Look at what it says. Teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them to a daily portion of food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank and where uh, they were to be educated for three years. Come on, say three years. Three years. Say it again, say three years. three years. And at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. And then verse 6 tells us I, uh, specifically who these guys were. I'll pick this up next week. And, and there among those were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called uh, Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. Now, there's three things I want you to take away from the text. Unfortunately, today we'll only be able to, to broach two of them. And the first thing I want us to understand is that if we're going to be aware of the food on the king's table, number thing, the first thing we need to know is that we must avoid complete cultural assimilation. Let me explain. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, don't let them assimilate you. <laughs> Turn to your other neighbor. Say, other neighbor, don't let them assimilate you. Now, this is an important concept that I'm, I'm, I'm sharing with you because understand with me, Jehoiakim has been led captive by Nebuchadnezzar, and all the rulers now of the, the, the empire has been captive. And I want you to see the process that this king now is taking through these newly captive people to change their identity, to change who they are, to assimilate them. Come on, y'all understand what I mean by that? You've seen this in Star Trek. You've seen it in other places where they, they, they strip you of who you are, and they let you become who you want them to be. And, and the reason I want to lay this out is as we are in the world awaiting our journey to heaven, be cautious because the goal of the enemy is to strip you of your identity and make you something that God did not create you to be. 
And if we're not cognizant of that, it's not as blatant, it's not as overt, it's not as prevalent as we think it may be, because here's what some of y'all are already saying, he might get them, but he's not going to get me. And I want you to see how subtle it is, how subtle it is that it takes for him to go through and assimilate people. So here's a couple of sub points I want you to get, right? Because if we're going to beware of the food uh, and the, the attack of the enemy, here's what you got to understand, that there's four things that he's going to do in this process of assimilation. The first thing I said is that there's an attack that goes forth on the future leaders. Look at the text. Look at the text. Let's talk about verse 3. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, the chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility. Look at verse 4. Youth without blemish, of good appearance, and skillful in wisdom, endowed with knowledge and understanding. And look at this. And competent to stand in the king's palace. Stop, stop. So here's what I want you all to understand. He's already captured Jehoiakim. That means he's already captured the current eldership. He's already captured the current generals, the current leaders, and he has them however he has them. But here was the concern. Here was the concern. Who among those that might be living in the tribe that three years from now, four years from now, five years from now can create an uprise and then cause these people to rebel against the Babylonian empire and take them back to where God brought them? Does this make sense? And I want to point that out because it's very, very important that, that you wonder why there's such an attack on tomorrow's generation you wonder why there's such an attack on the youth. You wonder why there's such an attack. You look at our young men. You see young men, come on, killing young men. You see all the violence. Come on, talk to me this morning. You see all the violence that's happening in culture. Don't make the mistake of thinking that that's accidental. Is the enemy knows that if I can deal with tomorrow's generation, I risk, I, I can eliminate the culture. I can re eliminate a generation from rising again. So he gets a hold of tomorrow's generation and changes them. Amen. I was sharing with first service, and I can't get this out of my spirit, Pastor Derek. I've been wondering, why is it that we've been struggling with youth ministry for so long, right? Why are we struggling with children's ministry so long? And then why is it that as a ministry, we, we say we want to put emphasis on it, but we haven't placed the emphasis that we need to place on it to get it to where it needs to go? Well, this message reminds me of the truth that if the enemy can stop tomorrow from becoming today, and if we keep ignoring it, come on now, Youth full of wisdom, of the nobility, come on, that, 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 that has aptitude to learn, that has aptitude to lead. We just saw little Joshua. He's after the Joshuas of tomorrow. That kid is a rarity, and the church needs to get to the place where we protect them. But, but here's what we do. We come in our little happy-go-lucky me, go meeting place, and we're content in who we are, and we don't understand the process of cultural assimilation. I ain't called to that. <laughs> you get it? He, he attacks the future leader. This is why... As a ministry, we're so invested in this whole millennial thing, right? Millennials, because we know that's tomorrow's church. That's the immediate future. And if you look around your, your, your midst and you don't see very many millennials, we cannot ignore the fact that the enemy is out having them in captivity and his goal is to culturally assimilate them. And if he can fool them into thinking you don't need church, do it your own way. I wish I had a praying church this morning. Y'all talk to me. Is this making sense? Amen. And if we sit idly and let him do what he does, shame on us. Shame on us. So he attacks, he attacks, he attacks the future leaders, right? And then notice the second thing he does. He doesn't only attack the future leaders, but he takes them through a process of assimilation where secondly, he changes their language. Oh my gosh. Let me, let, me, let me show you this. Let me show you this in the text, right? Look at this. Look at this. He says here in, in verse 4. Verse 4, again, let me read it. Youth without blemish of good appearance, skillful in the wisdom, um, endowed with knowledge and understanding and learning, 
competent to stand in the king's palace. In other words, to go before the king. Watch this. Teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. Here's what he says. Teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. I, I kind of like to use the word Babylonians there in place of the Chaldeans. In other words, so here's the thing. They, 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 where, we, where we just brought them from, they speak this God stuff. And all they know is this God stuff. And I want you to reprogram them to get the God stuff out of their mind. So, so for generations, they have known his literature. I wish I had a witness. So I want you all to take that away, and I want you to teach them a new language. I want you to teach them our culture. I want you to teach them our literature. I want you to teach them our language. And the whole intent, the whole intent is to reprogram them, to deculturize them and inculturate them differently so they forget where they came from. I wish I had somebody in here, right? And, and so if we can get them to speak differently and not speak the God stuff, here's the, the term I love to use. If we can get them to speak Babylonian, Come on, it's just making sense, right? And, and, and don't be so hard on them because he, here's the thing with me that I've noticed with us is that we, you ought to see, we ought to be cognizant of the truth that whenever, don't you find it interesting? Let me go here. Don't you find it interesting that whenever we find ourselves in a pickle, in a difficult situation, you ever notice a language that slip out of you that you wonder where that came from? Maybe y'all know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, y'all 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 just too saved and too, you know. You driving down the you going down the, and you stump your soul something, and, and the first thing out of your mouth is not, oh Lord, help. <laughs> Babylonian slips out. Am I right about it? You kind of get what I'm saying? In other words, in other words, you driving down the street and somebody cuts you off, and the first thing is that, Lord, bless them. <laughs> Babylonian slips out. Come on, talk to me. Come on, oh, y'all know I'm telling the truth. Somebody gets beneath your skin. Come on. And, and, and as opposed to you praying or eulogizing or speaking well to them, Babylonian slips out. And you wonder where that's coming from. It's because it's been implanted deep within you and you don't even realize the process of assimilation. And when anger steps in, our language changes and we start speaking the language of the culture. Let me go here. Church folk. It's not that we don't love God, but we don't realize that the enemy's goal is to assimilate us and to enculturate us. And one of the ways he does it is by changing our language. So here's what he does. He puts literature in everybody's room. Y'all like, ain't no literature in my room. Yes, it is. Comes on, are you laying your bed? And you watch it. And as you're watching it, they're teaching you the language. Come on. It's hard to watch a movie that's saying, praise the Lord. Come on. There's foul language. And all of that stuff is going in your head. And it's enculturating you. And you wonder why it comes out when it shouldn't. It's because we've allowed it to get in. I was saying this morning jokingly that some of us even got a, a timer on the lesson plan. That when we fall asleep, it'll go off. So guess what? We're sleeping hearing that stuff. The language of the culture. The literature of the culture. Do you see it? Right? And, and whenever, you wonder why there used to be a time where you can watch television without the nudity. You can go to a movie without the sexual nuances. But as the time changes and as culture changes and things shift, the lessons are becoming more and more overt. And the reason they become more and more overt is because we have become so assimilated that the little inferences doesn't move us. It takes the deeper and harder things. Because we don't realize we're being assimilated. The king has captured us. And his mission is to assimilate us. Does this make sense? Turn to him and say, neighbor, be careful with the language. Tell the other neighbor. Say, be careful with the language. Now you can tell him why you had to bust me out, all right? Yeah. So, so look, at, look at the next thing, okay? And then not only does he change their line, language, he changes their diet, okay? Now, now look at the text, look at the text, look at the text. I'm almost there. Look at the text. It says here, and then it says, and he assigned them, verse 5, um, 
daily portion of the food that the king ate and the wine that he drank. Oh, my goodness. So if you know anything about biblical history, biblical literature, there are books and there's chapters written on the dietary laws for the people of Israel. There's chapters and verses and, and, and prophecies and instructions that's written, don't eat this, don't eat that, don't do this, don't do that. And don't you find it interesting that a place of attack, I know what God said. But remember, I've got your God captive. So I'm the new God now. So forget what that God said. And you need to start doing what I'm telling you. Come on, doesn't that sound like culture? Come on, talk to me, y'all. We, we know what the Word of God says. Here's what popular culture is saying. Let's just love everybody. Let's just love each other. And here's the challenge. We're so busy eating food from the king's table that we are become accepting of the language of the new king. Can we say amen this morning? And the sad commentary is we're allowing it to infiltrate our camp. You get it? So, so, so God has specifically says, don't eat this. Don't do that. And then the king is saying, I get that. Let me give you some new stuff. I, I get it, but I've got your God captive, and I'm the new God now. So you need to do what I say do. And, and, and the people were placed in a very tempting situation where they had decisions to make. And look at this. And, and, and I like this last one. Not only did he change their language, not only change their diet, but the, the third thing, the fourth thing says is that they even went as far as to change their names. Look at, look at, look at, look at, look at verse 6. Among those were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and it tells you their biblical lineage of the tribe of Judah. And the chief eunuch gave them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar. Hananiah he called Shadrach. Mishael he called Meshach. And Azariah he called Abednego. Now, this is a sad commentary, but were I to conduct a test prior to me just reading that verse that I read, and if I were to say to you, what were the names of the Hebrew boys? Here's what you would say to me. You'd say Shadrach. You'd say, see, y'all know it, Meshach. And you'd say Abednego, right? And then my response to you would be, that was not their name. That was the name that the new king gave them in attempts to assimilate them, right? And the sad commentary is that he's been so effective in his assimilation tactic that he's got the church rep recognizing or knowing their Babylonian names because he's caused them to forgotten their God-given name. See how subtle that is? And we go to Sunday school, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the, the king is sitting back, I got them. That's what the name is in the word. <laughs> Assimilation, right? Here's what name signifies, and here's what name means. Names has something to do with authority. It's, it signifies rulership. It signifies governance over. It, 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 it signifies that you are not who you think you are, but you are who I say that you am. It's a change of everything about you. So I, I use this, let me use this illustration again. One of the things that, that's the most threatening and upsetting to women is when a man calls them out of their what? No, you didn't. Come on, y'all. Everything about you changes, right? Come on. Come on. Talk to me. Y'all know I am. I mean, you don't care how big he is, how tall he is. You're ready to fight when he calls you out of your wife. Because here's what you're saying. I'm not going to be your door stool. I'm not going to cause you to step under me. I'm not going to be less than. And we fight for who we say we are. But we don't realize every day the enemy sets out to do the same to us. Change character. Watch this. Let me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me read this to you real quick. Okay, let me read this real quick. I want you to see what their biblical name was. Listen to this. Daniel's name means El or God is my judge. Belteshazzar means Lord of the straightened treasure. Interesting with a small L. 
Hananiah means God has favored me. Shadrach means royal to the great scribe. Interesting. Mishael, who is what God is? Meshach means guest of the king. You don't even belong here. You didn't live here. Azariah means Yah or God has helped. Abednego means servant of Nebo. Watch this. All three of those boys had character traits in their name that reminded them of who God was in their life. And what does he do? He goes to each of them, listen to this, and he takes God out of their life. Takes God out of their life. Takes God out of their life in attempts to cause them to realize, I've got your God and I'm in charge. So here's what he does. If he can take God out of your character, when I mess up, it's because I forgot that God is in my character. Oh, come on, come on, come on. And here's what I said, what's wrong with me, right? And you do the same thing. When you start speaking Babylonian, that's not, you're being godly. Are you with me? Because the enemy has removed God from your cap. Come on, talk to me. And, and we forget who God is, and that crazy stuff start coming out. His goal is to take him out of your character. When we start lying, when we start cheating, when we start doing all this stuff, and that is what he attempted to do to Daniel and Ananiah, Hezariah, and Mishael. If I can remove God from them, so they gave them new names. Check this out. He tried to infuse a different character in them. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. Watch your character. Does this make sense? Come on, tell your neighbor. Say, neighbor, watch your character. Here's where I want to land. I'm not going to spend time here. Verse 8 says, But resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food, or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuch to allow him to not defile himself. To your neighbor, say, neighbor, beware of the king's food. Tell your other neighbor, say, other neighbor, beware of the king's food. Now, I need to say this. Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the food from the king's table. And so he asked the eunuch not to allow him to defile himself with the royal food. I got to say that a couple more times because I want you to get this. Um, I don't want there to be any misunderstanding. Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the food from the king's table, but... So he asked the chief eunuch not to allow him to defile himself. That word, defi that word defile speaks to the Hebrew word ga'al, and here's what it means to desecrate, to taint, to, my word, compromise, okay, to, to, to give in, to become subservient to. So here's what Daniel said. I'm not going to compromise. He decided not to defile himself with the food from the king table. Now, the reason I call the message this, and I want to be very, very clear because I want you all to hear me this morning. Don't make this about food. Very, very important, very, very important, right? Because understand with me that we're going to change his name. That we're going to change his language. Come on. They want to change his diet. They're going to change the literature he was going to use. So hear me say this to you as you read this story a little differently. In all of these things, when it came time for Daniel to exercise, here's what Daniel said. He resolved not to defile himself with the food from the king's table. Right? So, so let me be very, very clear with you. Daniel was saying, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Now, I need to also say this to you. 
what's kind of implied in the grammar, the Hebrew grammar, um, grammatically, is, is that imperfect aspect of that verb, right? And, and here's what the imperfect aspect says, is that Daniel didn't wait until he found himself in the situation to change anything. He didn't say, I'm not going to do it just because the king tempted him, okay? While he was in Judah, he said, I'm not going to do it. So when he got to Babylon and the king said what was going to happen, he had already resolved. Y'all getting it? Yeah. You see, because here's the problem. If he had waited till then to say, I'm not going to do it, when then was over, he'd go back. Y'all get it? This is why we start and we stop things. Can I talk to you all this morning? Right? So, so here, here's what that means, is that, Daniel, we're going to change your name. Daniel, we're going to change your diet. Daniel, we're going to change your language. Daniel, we're, nope. I'm good. Belteshazzar, don't know who you talking about. Y'all not hearing me. Shadrach, must be talking dude around the corner. Meshach, hey. Abednego, you're not going to change my name. Come on, I wish I had somebody in here. You're not going to change my character. You're not going to change my language. I wish I had somebody in here. Why? The reason you won't do that is because I know who I am before I got into Babylon captivity, and I'm a cognizant of the fact that the earth is not my home. I belong to the king, so even though I live here, I'm not of it. And need I say this parenthetically, the enemy is so subtle. I just spoke about the youth. Pastor Topaz was sharing, me, was sharing, me, sharing with me this week about a funeral that she went to where this, it was a gang-related and, and a young 10-year-old boy got up in the podium talking about his brother and she said she was blown away at the language he was using and the gang signs and all the stuff he was doing. I want you to hear me say this, that the enemy had gotten a hold of that child as a young child before he even turned to adult. So he had already assimilated him. So guess what he adjusted? If we don't get our children. Don't make this about food. Because here's what will happen. If it's only about food, you're going to stop eating. And then at the end of the stop eating, you're going to go back to the king's table. Because for the majority of us, we say Daniel fasts, and we go to this book, and we say he fasted for 15 days. No, 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 no. Don't make that mistake. It was his lifestyle. Because <laughs> nowhere in Daniel you're going to read that. He stopped, and then he started. He stopped. And then he started. I, you you kind of get what I'm saying? Because lock into this. For three years, that's what I had you said, three years. For three years, he had to go through this stuff, right? For three years, he maintained his standard. For three years, he maintained his attitude. For three years, he maintained his identity. I'm not saying there's nothing against fasting. What I am saying, don't approach this with a start and a stop mindset. Define what do I need to become and then become it. You're not going to change my name, king. And so here's what we do, though. Here's what we do. Here's what we do. Y'all don't get mad with me. Don't get mad with me. We have this mindset where we, we're in Babylon. We eat from God's table. And then we leave and we go back and we eat from the king's table. And we come back and we eat from God's table. And then we go back and we eat from the king's table. Y'all don't believe me yet, because here's what we do. Sunday, we're all at church, and right now we're eating from God's table. Monday, whose table will you be eating from? <laughs> Tuesday, whose table will you be eating from? When you go to work, whose table will you be? You get it? You get it? You get it? When you go home this afternoon through the TV on, whose table will you be eating from? Are we going back to the literature and the language? Here's Daniel. Monday, God's table. Tuesday, God's table. Wednesday, God's table. Thursday, 
and, and lock into this, lock into this, lock into this. I want you to get this because you can see he, he, he'd leave the place and on Monday he'd be at work, but he'd make work God's table. <laughs> you get it? And so when he said he resolved not to, let me, let me show you how deep this is and we're going to pick this up next week because you might not have put this in perspective. If you make this only about food, you'll think it's about food. Remember with me in chapter 3 when Nebuchadnezzar said, hey, I'm going to erect this great image, right? And when I erect the race image, this great image, at the sound of the trumpet, at the sound of everything, I need everybody up in here to, to bow. Okay, everybody, right? I need y'all to bow and worship. Here's what Daniel said. He resolved not to defile himself with the food from the king's table. So guess what? He didn't bow. You get it? You remember this one in the lion's den? When they're about to throw him in the lion's den, here's the same thing he said. He resolved not to defile himself with the food from the what? Okay. So I want you to hear me say, it's not about food. It's about a consecration and a commitment not to allow the world to enter us, to assimilate us, so we look so much like the world. Granted, the fast that might be the beginning of the mechanism to help us change the light sign, the lifestyle, but it's not only about the fast itself. The fast by itself is not an end. Jesus needed to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and he went in the wilderness and fasted for 40 days. And when he came out, you don't see Jesus going in and out of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Permanent lifestyle. Is this making sense? So here's what I'm saying to you all, and I'm done as we go through this process. Resolve, Lord, what is it have I been partaken of the king's table? That I need to stop. It's going to be different for everybody. Because we all have a different delicatessen that we like. Can we be honest this morning? Come on, y'all. Don't look at me like y'all holy. Amen. We all got something we like. That's why we keep going back for seconds and thirds. Can we be honest about it this morning? Come on, y'all. Let me know I'm talking to real people. Can we, can, you get it? That's why we go back, because we like that meal at the king's table. You get it? So you say, you know, Lord, I've been overeating on that, so help me stop that. And so when I enter the spirit of consecration, it's for that. Make sense? And then in time, this is the beauty of consistently fasting and doing this more and more and more and more, the more we do this, the more we look like Jesus. The less control the king have over us. Because like Daniel, I'm going to pick this up next week, we can stand firm. We can be who God would have us to be. Does this make sense, guys? Be cautious of the king's table. Because it won't always look like what you think it ought to look like. You get it? Pastor K, come bow your heads with me. Lord, you're wonderful. You're gracious, you're merciful, you're kind, you're all that, Lord. So God, as your word has gone forth this morning, we want to be cautious of the king's table or the food. Don't eat the food. We're in the world, but we're not of it, God. So Holy Spirit, speak. Holy Spirit, do what only you could do. Holy Spirit, be God in our midst. So God, as we have shared your word and we prepare ourselves, God, as a ministry, as individuals for 21 days of fasting and consecration, it's not about the fruits or the vegetables or the meat or the whatever. It's what are you calling us to give up, God? And fast is a means to an end. It's not an end in itself. So thank you for this word. Let us be like Daniel. Make a decision. We're not going to be like the world. We're going to be in it, but not of it. So manifest yourself. Speak to us, God, and thank you for what you're doing. Show us ourselves. Show us ourselves. With your head bowed, take a moment to pray.